Welcome once again to our Bible studies to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We're just blessed that you can join us. And on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself, we just want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, before we start, I'm going to ask Brother Mark if you'll just ask God's blessing upon our time. Uh, you know, uh, he asked me to do this every week. And it says in the Bible, um, by your vain repetitions, uh, you think you gain something. I don't want to say the same thing over and over again. So on the way over here, I'm asking God, okay, what do I say? And I'm, I've got a Christian radio station on, and a song pops into my head. And it's a Godspell song, Day by Day. And there's three things that the guy pray, prays for, to see you more clearly, follow you more nearly, and love you more dearly. And if we can see, follow, and love Christ more, those are the three things that I pray tonight. So Lord, may we see you. May we have the courage to follow you. And Lord, just put in your spirit in our heart so that we, we may love you and others more. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that was a great song in Godspell, but it actually came from a prayer by a monk, I think, in the 13th century. Hmm. It lasted the, yeah. depths, the <laughs> test yeah, of time. Exactly, yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, it, it's still in the same vein, because I want to show you one of the things that I consider uh, one of the most dangerous things in all of Christianity, but as an encouragement, okay? And I'm going to start by sharing some of my testimony because that's the only way I can do this. So bear, bear with me a little bit, all right? I was saved sitting at my kitchen table. I had an, a radical encounter with Jesus Christ back in the mid-1970s. And at the time, I was the president of a small uh, advertising agency in New York, in the New York area, just in the suburbs of New York City. And that day, when I say it was a radical, a radical encounter with Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. um, I will just tell you this. At the end of that encounter, I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, you've had your life, now it's mine. Mm -hmm. Well, that brought me to the place where I, as rapidly as I could, shut down that advertising agency, transferred the clients to other agencies so that I could go off and pray and seek the Lord because I knew He was calling me to serve Him with all of my ability. And I promise you, up to that point, I had not served Him at all. So I left the business, I gave up the business, and I went off to pray. And it was a wonderful experience. And one of the things that happened is, um, having been raised, I'm, 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 having been raised Catholic and finding in my own life contradictions, I didn't understand the teachings of the Catholic Church, and I had never read the Bible, but now I was devouring the Bible. And I was finding what, I, what seemed to be contradictions between the Bible and the teachings of the, that I understood in the Catholic Church. So I did my best. I went and I visited a priest. I saw the Monsignor. I went to a bishop. And I wasn't getting answers that satisfied me. So the Lord blessed me considerably that I had the opportunity to go to a Catholic seminary and do graduate work in a Catholic seminary in New York so I could actually find out what the Catholic Church believed and taught, or tried, at least. Well, I, I had a very good opportunity to, yeah. to find that, and I did. I mean, I studied sacramental theology. I'm doing graduate work in that sacramental theology and in an Old Testament uh, scripture. Well, I'm not going to go too far with that, but I, I will tell you that um, it, it gave me a deeper understanding of what God was calling me to in my life. I'll let it go with that. But while I was doing that, I got a job. Now, remember, I, I had been a management consultant in New York City working for, prior to being in the advertising agency, mm -hmm. I had been in management in one of the largest corporations in the world, in New York City, 
and doing consulting work with other large corporations. I mean, I did consulting work for some of the biggest companies in the world. And now, when I was going to the seminary to help support us, as Alice and I were living uh, up on off the Hudson River in New York, I took a, a job working in a boatyard, a very menial job. And I, I love being around the water, but this was not fun work by any means whatsoever. And it just so happened that the fellow that owned the boatyard, who hired me, began to hate me. Mm -hmm. uh, and he hated me. I'm a nice guy. He hated me. It wasn't about me. It was about my relationship with the Lord, which was no secret. Right. And the fact that I was in the seminary. That, for, for whatever reason, it troubled him. And he gave me all of the worst, dirtiest jobs that he could find in that place. And he was just outright mean to me. I'm a grown man, I and mean, I'm going to, I'm, as I say, I've been successful in business, I'm going to the seminary. And one day, a group of boat owners in this boatyard that I was working at came up to me and said, why do you put up with this? Why don't you just, why don't you just bang this guy, pow, zoom? Which, by the way, back in those days, I could have done. <laughs> and I shared with them why I didn't. And the reason I didn't was because of the grace of God and how God had forgiven me of being a stupid and the love of God that he poured in my heart. Mm -hmm. And what I was doing was being submissive to that authority that I had put myself under. And I was trying to love him in return for the hate that he was giving me. Right. Well, these guys were pretty much astounded at that. But I think you said two, of them. two of them prayed with me that day to receive the Lord. There's a reason for me sharing this, okay? From there, I left the seminary. And I started a ministry, a street ministry, in, and this was in the bad old days, in Times Square in New York. This is not the Times Square that if you know New York today, that was not. This was a time when it was all triple X movies, it was all pimps and prostitutes, drug addicts. It was, it was a very a, scary place. It was, it was a horrible place. It was a pit. Yes. And I would go down there and I would just wander the streets and share the gospel with whoever I, God led me to. And I'm talking about pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers and drug addicts. Uh, it was a blessed time. But the time came when I felt like God was calling me away from that. And I went and I got a job. Now, up until that point in time, other than the boatyard, which was a part-time job, I didn't have any job. I was doing this full-time. I was working. Yeah. And well, Alice was working in, in my plains, New York. And I figured I'd get a job, so I got a newspaper and I looked through, this is before the internet days, I looked in the newspaper and I saw a job that I, was for communications equipment and for selling communications equipment, and that's something I was very skilled with and very knowledgeable about. So I went and I applied for the job. And I had an interview with the president of this company, a communi satellite communications company in New York. And when I applied for the job, he read my resume and he offered me a job as the national sales manager of the company. So I didn't get the job as a salesman. I got the job as a sales manager. And I will tell you it was an adventure because I did all of the sales training for this company and I did all of the sales training out of the book of Proverbs. We increased the sales of that company in the first year by 300%. It's amazing. Yeah. So many people got saved there at, at work. Mm. I mean, people who worked for me, customers that we saw. I mean, people were getting saved. Now, was that, I'm just going to let it go with that and come back to it. It was an amazing experience. I had people working for me, say, now, who got and saved, and, and those who were not. But the Lord was doing such incredible things in that business. Mm -hmm. That where, you know, this, these are the days of nine to five. People would come to work at nine o'clock and five o'clock, blah, zoom, they're watching the clock and they're out. Well, in this place, 5 o'clock, everybody wanted to sit around and share what God had done that day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like going to a revival every day. No, it was going to a revival every day. <laughs> and, and God was honoring it and blessing it. That experience led me to an incredible understanding yes. of an amazing, amazing truth. But I'm going to approach this a little bit backwards now, okay? I said that I was talking, well, I wanted to talk about something very dangerous. I'm not going to talk about Russia. I'm not going to talk about China or Iran 
or North Korea or radical Islam and not going to talk about ISIS. I'm going to talk about what I see as the real threat. Remember, Jesus said, don't fear those who can kill the body. That's right. Right? And remember, too, we've talked about a number of times in this program over the past months about the power of words. Yes. All right? Yes. Here's some of the most powerful and dangerous words that I've heard in Christianity. Because people would ask me, I, I, I skipped something here that's important. When I was working in satellite before that, I had started I had started a congregation. Actually, what I had started was a Bible study. That's right. And the Bible study, we wound up doing a, a two and a half, three hour Bible study on Tuesday nights and a three hour that went into the early hours of the morning Bible study on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And people were coming and getting saved. And uh, it wound up being the foundation of a church mm -hmm. that I started there in the suburbs of New York City. So I was pastoring full-time. Mm -hmm. I had a full-time job out in the marketplace. Right. And I found other side things to do. <laughs> so Bible study people, right? people yeah. who, who knew me would say, well, are you in full-time ministry? That's the dangerous term. Yes. That's the most dangerous thing ever uttered. Mm. Full-time ministry. Because full-time ministry... There is no such thing as a part-time Christian. No. No. Nor is there so any such thing as part-time ministry. That's right. Okay, are you ready to argue that point? <laughs> Bear with me, okay? This is what I consider the biggest problem in Christianity today is we have an attitude cultivated within us yes. that being a Christian is a part-time affair. Mm. Okay? When uh, those of you who know me, and if you know that I had, Al Alice and I lived in Central America out in the bush. Mark was there and spent time with us there, lived there for a while, in Belize, Central America. We went there as missionaries. I was hit by a speeding semi-truck. I was on foot and I got hit by a speeding semi-truck. Okay. It banged me up good. Mm -hmm. the, there were two fellows in the truck that hit me, and they were both killed on the spot. And, you know, here all these years later, here I am. So, But after the accident, I came back to the States and got fixed up, and we went back down to Belize. Mm -hmm. But I found, first of all, we couldn't live out in the bush. We couldn't live out in the jungle anymore. It was just impractical because I went down, I was on a cane, my leg had been, my right leg had been pretty much destroyed. You know, and to carry a machete in one hand, which you have to do to hack your way through the bush. Yeah. And a cane in the and other one. And a cane in the other one. It was hard to carry, keep my Bible under my, under my armpit. So we wound up moving into the city, into the main city, in Belize City. And again, God opened a door for me because of an Australian friend that we had down there. And I wound up doing consulting work for the government of Belize and got to minister to the Prime Minister, the Attorney General, and many high officials because I share the gospel with them, yes. okay? When we came back to the States, we came back and we moved to Naples, Florida where I started a small business mm -hmm. that turned out to be very, very successful. And, but it wasn't very long because we had friends who had been part of the church that I pastored in Florida and they kept saying to me, because I had talked to them so many times about biblical principles in the workplace yes okay and they said well why don't you do a seminar why don't you do a seminar and they randy and ellen were their names they and alice and i we actually moved to california and we started a ministry called the md solomon it's the md solomon institute yeah. and the focus of that well you know what i'm not going to tell you what the focus was i'm going to read you what we have on that website okay here's the focus of md solomon the M.D. Solomon Institute was founded in 1992 with a vision that the Lord gave us to equip and encourage Christians to live a holy and holy, that's spelled two different ways, integrated life. A life in which a person's business life was not separated from his or her spiritual life, family life from workplace life, church life from daily life. Our goal is to teach the best practices in all walks of life as defined by scripture 
to achieve excellence in all walks of life. Now, we've done that seminar many times. I mean, we've done it many times in many places across the United States. Mm -hmm. We've done it in Europe, done it out in ships at sea, mm -hmm. all right? Because I believe that following Jesus, following his life and his teaching, is not about church on Sunday. It's about life. Yes. And life in the Spirit is about ministry, serving. First to the Lord, and then to the household of the faith, and then to all the world. There's priorities here. Yes. It says in Galatians, Paul wrote to the church at, in, of the Galatians and said, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of the faith. Galatians 6.10 All Christians have a ministry. Now, if, if, if you've missed some of the programs that we've done here earlier, they are all available on the Bible Talk website or go to InSearchOfChristianity.com because we've discussed this in detail there. And I don't want to do it again in detail, but I just want to bring this to you. In. I'm, I'm going to distract myself. I've said from the very beginning of this program that this is for the bond servants of Jesus That's Christ. Right. That's correct. This is, the, this is supposed to be the meat of the Word, not the milk of the Word, mm -hmm. right? And... If your expectation is that you can come here and in 30 minutes get everything you need, you're wrong. I am here not so much to teach as I am to encourage you to hear from the Lord. Prime the pump as it were. And absolutely. Because faith comes by hearing. Not hearing me, but hearing God. You've got to spend time with this, apart from this program, with the Lord if you want it to become the reality of your life. All right, having said that, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 12, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right? There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's verses 4 to 7. Now in 11 it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. Everybody is equipped by the Holy Spirit for a ministry that God has called you to. Now some ministries are more visible. Okay? Yes. The fellow who stands behind the pulpit and speaks to you on Sunday. Mm -hmm. That's highly visible to the whole congregation. Yes. The guys who get up and play songs. The music ministry. The music ministry, not the worship ministry. Right. They're highly visible. But you want to know something? The guy who gets up, Joe the sweeper, who gets up at the end and cleans. That's just as much a ministry. And every ministry is supposed to be what you do as unto the Lord. All right? And they are all precious in the eyes of God. But every Christian has a ministry. Can you deny that based on the scriptures I just read? Not at all. Okay, then here's the other thing. Every ministry is full time. You can't walk out the door of your church building on a Sunday and throw the switch and turn it off. As a matter of fact, that may be the place you turn it off when you go in there. <laughs> right. Because so far, we seem to equate ministry with what goes on inside that building rather that goes what goes on in our own lives okay some of the ministries that are more visible that i just talked about uh they may they may get more attention because they're stepping on serpents okay more visibly right. <clears throat> one of the things we learned in the jungle okay i come from new york city they didn't have a lot of snakes in new york city you go to the jungle, the snakes. Yeah. Well, the snakes of New York City were different kinds. Different kind, yeah. <laughs> Typically, if you leave a snake alone, that snake's going to leave you alone. But if you step on a snake, it's going to bite. Yes. It's going to strike. Yes. But Jesus has given us authority to tread Serpent. on serpents. Yes. Why is the church afraid of the devil when the devil is supposed to be afraid of the church? You know, there's the account of the sons of Sceva in the book's Acts. Mm -hmm. 
in the book of Acts. And while the apostles are casting out demons and doing all this, they see this and they come and they're trying to cast out demons. Mm -hmm. All right? They're trying to cast out a demon and this demon stops and says to them, Who are you? Jesus I, I know. Paul I know about. But who are you? Mm -hmm. And beats them silly. Kaboom. Let me ask you a question. How did they know how did the evil spirit know about Paul? I'm going to tell you. I know the answer to that. Because in Paul's life, those demons were running around saying to each other, oh, you better watch out for that Paul. If you run into that Paul, you better watch out. That's supposed to be the life that we live, walking always in the triumph of Christ Jesus, walking with the weapons that are divinely powerful when he's been disarmed. It's the reputation we need to Why have. is the church afraid of the, the devil when the devil is supposed to be afraid of the church? It's a reasonable question. Okay. I said some of these ministries are more visible. And they're worthy of honor. Think about that because it says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 1 Timothy chapter 5, and even, you know, those ministries should be supported financially. It says if you're being taught by somebody, you know, you're receiving spiritual blessings, give them the, the material blessings. That's in Galatians 6.6. 6. But all, each and every Christian, has a spirit-ordained ministry. You know, a couple of months ago, we, we took a long look at the sixth chapter of the book of Acts. Because I said that that is one, I see that as one of the most significant turning points in the history of the church. And that happened in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that took place in there was that Peter said, as he spoke for himself and the other apostles, implying that they were different than the regular Christians, he said, but we must devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, Acts 6.4. And I said, and you can go listen to this, if you're a plumber, you had better be devoted yeah. and give attention to the word of God. That's right. If you're a doctor out there, you had to better devote yourself to prayer and the ministry of the word. If you're a clerk in a grocery store, you have the same obligation. We are all called by Jesus to abide, to continue in his word and be devoted by prayer. There is no special class of people for that. No, there's not. <clears throat> Think of these verses. These are for you if you are a Christian. If you're a Christian, not if you've been to seminary, not if you've been ordained, for all Christians. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We have a ministry of reconciliation. What I just read was 2 Corinthians 5.20. And in 2 Corinthians 4.1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. You have been equipped for the ministry that God has called you to. It says, now remember, this was a time of slavery. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men. Ephesians 6, verses 5 through, 5 through 7. If you have a job, you have a ministry. Your ministry is in that workplace. God has sent you there as an ambassador. You say, well, I, you can't, I'm not allowed that. Yes, you are. You are commanded. You are to be ready in season and out to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean that you stop doing what you have been hired to do and stand on a table and start preaching the gospel. It means, like Paul wrote to Timothy, that you are ready in season and out to bring a word. You know, it just reminded me, when you worked for the Christian Publishing Company for Church Relations, I remember you used to tell your employees that when they stepped into their little cubicle, that was there. They were ambassadors, and they were on. Take off your shoes because you are standing in holy yeah. ground. I suggested to. Uh, right. I, I suggested to all these people. Yes, when you come and you go into the, you know, your cubicle, take off your shoes. It's holy ground. That's right. What? Go ahead. One of the old fathers of the church said, "Preach the gospels, 
preach the gospel. Use words if you have to. No. The, the point is, you, you can, in a business setting, bring that word in due season. Yes. You know, if you see an employee getting frustrated, and you pay, remind them that God, God has patience available. Patience is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If people talk about you having patience, because they should see patience in your life, it's the evidence of a redeemed it's life is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Tell them. It's not because of you're such a good person, because you're a good lady or a good man. It's because of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's right. I can't tell you how many times. Do you, you ever see people get mad, angry at work, either with angry with another yes. employee or customer? You know, the Word of God says that a, a harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle word turns away wrath. If you work, if you have a job and you've not read the book of Proverbs lately, you're making a mistake. Because that's what you need to be equipped for the workplace. That's a good place to start. Amen. This is it. You know, God invented gravity. It doesn't matter whether you're saved or unsaved. Go jump over a building and see it's going to work for both of you. Right. It rains on the just and the unjust. This, this word that God has entrusted you with has purpose and it can touch and bless lives, you don't have to start being a preacher. Just bring the Word. They'll know it. You'll get opportunity to share the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have a job, it is your ministry. If you're a mother at home with children, you have a ministry. Mm -hmm. If you're a wife and you have a husband, you have a ministry. Husband, and you I mean, everybody has a ministry. And yes, it's a full-time ministry. You can't turn it on and off. But when you have a, a, a professional priestly class that wants to elevate itself. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, please. Not, this, I'm not talking about every person that's in ministry by any means. But you'll recognize this when you're, the Spirit of God makes you aware of it. If they're trying to elevate themselves by telling you this is where ministry happens and I'm the minister, you know what? When we lose sight of the priesthood of all who believe in their hearts and confess their work with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, all who have been made right with the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross, all who are being led by the Spirit of God, if we lose sight of that priesthood that we have, then the devil has entrapped us inside of our little brick church buildings and stopped God's work yes. out there. Seek God. If you're not clear what your ministry is, seek the Lord because He'll tell you. Absolutely. Yes. And remember, He will equip you. Unlike the Pharaoh who called the people of God to build bricks and didn't equip them with the straw they needed, God will never call you to a ministry without equipping you for that ministry. That's right. You have a blessed responsibility from whom much has been given, much is required. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord God. Jesus. That you choose to use us. That you can still use the foolish to shame the wisdom of the wise. Lord, that you filled us with your love. We're earthen vessels filled with a treasure. So, Lord, we have so much to give as to one another. Mm. To the people who don't know you. Embolden us, Lord God. Help us to walk in the power that you have given us. The boldness you have given us. To be used by you to touch other lives. To fulfill our ministries. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, hallelujah. <laughs> Please be encouraged. Please be encouraged to find a ministry and walk fully in the ministry that God is calling you to. You have a ministry. Amen. Bye-bye. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame But I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sin